Is America reaching her expiration date? Could our Constitution, which guarantees the civil liberty of all people, given by God, guarded by government, is our Constitution in danger of being lost? Stay with us for Truth For New Generation as we discuss these and other issues on today's program. Alex McFarland here, and thank you for watching Truth For A New Generation. Is our country in trouble? Is our Constitution in jeopardy? You know, with the recent election and the likely incoming administration that's promised things like big taxes, open borders, uh, more protections for liberal causes rather than for the civil rights of people. It has many people wondering if our government that the founders envisioned as being limited and controllable, has our government grown so unwieldy, a huge behemoth, that it it just grows and spreads and further taxes and restricts the civil rights of people that the government that the founders saw as being a servant to the people has become just a, a monster that controls the people. Now, this is worth talking about. We've got a great show today, and we've, in a few minutes, got an interview with North Carolina Supreme Court Justice Paul Newby. We need to really ask ourselves, what is going on with our, with our government? 2020, when we're filming this, has been such uh, an amazing year in many historical ways. But frankly, as one who is a student of American history, a very troubling year. We've seen riots. We've seen uh, an election with, at best, irregularities and, at worst, per perhaps fraud in many states. And yet, when people have tried to exercise recourse and look at the uh, honesty or lack thereof in the counting of the votes. There's been great pushback. There have been known scandals that have been suppressed by the media, like Hunter Biden's ties with China and money by China going into the pockets of politicians and favors being promised. And so we've got to ask, where is our nation? And is this nation uh, reaching a point of danger and vulnerability that the founders warned us about. Now, President James Madison, who was working to get the Constitution ratified by the colonies, later to become states, in Federalist Paper Number 45 in 1788, James Madison said that the powers of the government should be few and well-defined. Think about that. Now, the, the powers given to the states would be numerous and indeterminate. In other words, they believed in the rights of states above the power of the government. Today, we're really experiencing the 180-degree inverse of that. Uh, states' rights are being overridden, especially during 2020, during the time of the pandemic. Uh, the states' rights have expanded with mayors, leaders, governors, judges doing so many things that many, uh, and not just conservatives and certainly not just Christians, but many people on both sides, right and left, have expressed great concern in response to it that the, the powers of exercised by governors and certainly the power exercised by the federal government seems to just be unrestrained, not bound by constitutional precedent. And people are asking, is America in trouble? Our future freedoms, our, definitely our prosperity, where is all of this going to go? And on this program, this is a call at least to ask what's going on, but maybe a, a, a call to action for you to get involved, not only to pray for America, to stay informed, but to be an influencer yourself. Now, James Madison, he made a quote that I want to give you in this first segment. I want you to think about this. Madison warned that the state of freedom without the citizens possessing moral and political grounding would endanger the future of the country. He said democracies, 
Pure democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention. They have ever been incompatible with personal security or the rights of property and have in general been short-lived and violent in their deaths. Why? What is the answer? Well, I believe the answer so that our nation doesn't have turbulence and a short-lived existence and a violent death is not only personal grounding morally and spiritually, but also the structure, the balance of powers, the checks and accountabilities that the founders envisioned. It was genius, but we stand to lose it all if you and I don't stay informed and get involved. Stay tuned, don't go away. Truth For New Generation is back after this. I just returned from a conference at The Cove and it was absolutely breathtaking in every way. The mountain views, the tranquil areas within the woods and just being alone with God. Mornings spent watching the sunrise from a rocking chair with coffee in one hand and my Bible in the other. Evenings spent reflecting on the incredible spiritual teaching. It's the embodiment of peacefulness. Come and experience the Cove for yourself. Welcome back to Truth For A New Generation. So glad you're watching. You know, when we're talking about government and the Constitution, it's very beneficial to go to an expert. And we have one here with us today, uh, the newly elected Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, Justice Paul Newby, graciously giving some time from his busy schedule to be with us this morning. And thank you so much for being with us today. Alex, I so appreciate you, your ministry, all you do, and I'm honored and delighted to be with you. Well, well, thank you very much. And I, I assume you're coming to us from the state capital, Raleigh, North Carolina, correct? I am, yes. Uh, 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 my schedule is such that um, I have a lot to do here in Raleigh. So, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I want to talk about the election, and by the way, congratulations on, on your victory. And tell us, if you would, what led you to get involved in law and ultimately to the, the highest judicial bench in the state of North Carolina? Well, uh, uh, you know, I'm the first lawyer in my family. I grew up in uh, Guilford County, North Carolina, just down the road from, from you. And uh, mom was a school teacher, uh, dad a printer, uh, Christian family by God's grace, um, and uh, just uh, along the way, I, I had the privilege in uh, 1976, uh, uh, I jokingly tell people the only four years I ever spent out of state, uh, the state of North Carolina were the four years I went to Duke. Of course, it's located here, it just doesn't know it. But uh, I had the privilege of working for Chief Justice Warren Berger at the US Supreme Court. And um, I really did a, a deep dive on our Declaration of Independence. It was the bicentennial and just really marveled at God's work among the framers uh, uh, to try to establish for us uh, a biblically based governmental system. So as I, I looked at those things, I ended up going to UNC to law school where I met my wonderful uh, wife and uh, you know, practice law for, uh, I was in the midst of practicing law. I guess I'd been out of uh, uh, 24 years and 2004, I'm praying First Timothy 2 for those in authority over us that we can live quiet, peaceful lives. Religious liberty is really the essence of that prayer um, that we can give the salvation message that there's uh, a relationship uh, with God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And as I'm praying that, I'm sensing in my spirit, uh, uh, what about you? Will you run? And my response was, here I am, Lord. Send somebody else. This is crazy. There's no way I'm going to do this. Uh, newbies have been in North Carolina since 1700, but we've never done anything. And, you know, Scooby Dooby, vote for newbie. I, I, you know, uh, I've never done anything in politics. That, that wasn't gonna... your slogan, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, sadly, back then, it was, uh, you know, people had to remember names and I tell people that was uh, my my contribution of mind pollution, you know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, by God's grace, we won in 2004. By God's grace, we won again in 2012, uh, eight-year terms. And I'm the senior member of the court. And so when the vacancy occurred, uh, of course, the governor had a temporary appointment, but um, he, uh, God just put on my heart, my wife's heart. We prayed about it and we felt that this is what God was calling us to do. 
Well, let, let me ask you this. And by the way, I want to thank you for not only serving our state and serving our country, but uh, being willing to express your Christian convictions uh, along the journey, because uh, you, you're, you're a, a, a justice, but you're also a believer in Christ, and you've made no secret of that. And, and frankly, I think that's very courageous, and I appreciate that about you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would not be on the court except by God's will. Uh, as it says in Chronicles, you know, uh, God is the one who establishes. Uh, and, and you've got your platform, I have my platform, but we live in a world, if you look at all the statistics, all the hopelessness, the suicides, the drug situation, the alcoholism, uh, we live in a world that's crying out for an answer. And the answer is what? The answer to who am I, why am I here, and what happens when I die? We have the answer. We've got the answer. So uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 520, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. You're the ambassador, I'm an ambassador. We just have different platforms. So let me ask you this, what does a state Supreme Court justice do? Uh, yeah, that's a great what, question. You know, what, what types of cases make their way to your bench? Well, the most frequently asked question I get as I go around the state talking to folks is, oh, you're just on the Supreme Court, never met one. Can you help me with my speeding ticket? The answer is no. Uh, <laughs> if you got a speeding ticket at the Supreme Court, fire your lawyer. Not a good day for you. Uh, we, we're a jurisprudential court. So we look at cases, not from the, uh, you know, we look at cases and say, if we decide the case this way, what will be the future impact of the precedent that that case uh, 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 means? So uh, our job is to apply the law uh, as written, I believe, apply the Constitution as written, that makes me a constitutionalist, apply the law as written, that makes me a conservative, and I've done that for 16 years. And let me get back just for a second to the foundations of our, of our state. Our state constitution says this, we the people of the state of North Carolina are grateful to Almighty God, the sovereign ruler of nations, for the preservation of the American Union and the existence of our civil, political, and religious liberties and acknowledging our dependence upon God for the continuation of those blessings to us and to our posterity. We have that heritage, but it is a God-given heritage. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and I completely agree. You know, uh, we live in a time that uh, ad infinitum, we hear separation of church and state, separation of church and state. And yet those words of our state constitution that you just recited, I think that would be an epiphany to many people to know that those words are in there. Uh, I, I encourage people to read the founding documents. Don't read about them, read them. Uh, our state constitution, North Carolina state constitution 1776 says, that we have an inalienable, that means stamped on at inception, we have an inalienable right to worship Almighty God according to the dictates of our own consciousness. Now, the state government violated that in uh, 1861. So in 1868, we added, and no governmental authority whatsoever shall interfere with those rights. Uh, our framers recognized that religious liberty is foundational. George George Washington, in his farewell address, said there are two pillars that hold up self-government that so it doesn't become mob, mob rule, and those are morality and religion, and he said if you're a friend of a Republican form of government, then you're a friend of religion because that, that uh, internal sense of right and wrong, God-given sense of right and wrong, is what allows us to self-govern. You know, during the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett to the U.S. Supreme Court, she said that she was an originalist, a, a constitutionalist. And, and by that, I, I believe that she means she takes the words as written, not fluid, not, you know, filtering them through current events, but an originalist. Now, former CBS anchor Dan Rather made fun, and he said, oh, I guess we're going to go back to riding mules and cooking with wood fire. Uh, and it shows me he completely was clueless about what originalist meant. If you would, help us understand, what does it mean to be a constitutionalist and originalist, and why would this be important today, Justice? 
Well, the question is, um, uh, I've got my state constitution here as well as my federal, but the question is, do these words have meaning? Is it a social contract or is it a situation where I get to say, uh, this, is a, can, this can mean whatever I want to. Had you rather have the social contract uh, written, if you will, in the document. So if you, wanted to, if you want to change it, you go through the amendment process as opposed to, well, let's just change the meaning of the word law. Let's just change the meaning of, you pick the word. So I think from a social contract standpoint, uh, I think that these, every word has meaning. It was chosen precisely by the drafters and uh, that's, that's how it should be enforced. It's like if you had a building contract to build a house for $300,000 and you got a $450,000 bill from the builder and you said, what is this? And the builder said, well, you know, uh, prices of material went up, prices of labor went up. And, you know, our contract was just kind of a suggestion. It was a nice framework for our agreement, but what I can say that it, 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 you got to pay me whatever I want. You know, that's crazy. You got to have a meeting of the minds. A contract is a meeting of the minds. A social contract, a constitution is a meeting of the minds with precise meaning to all the provisions. And that's our job to enforce it and allow the people to change it when they want to. And the parameters of the contract, the covenant, if you will, uh, the parameters are laid down in the meanings of the words, correct? Precisely. Precisely. Yeah. How concerned are you about the health and preservation, the longevity of our Constitution, the U.S. Constitution? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I ran in 2004 because I was concerned about judicial activism, legislating from the bench. Uh, I, one of my campaign themes was uh, nobody died and made me king. One of my campaign themes was I'm not a legislator in a black robe. Uh, don't elect me to enact policies and act, uh, elect me to enforce the laws as intended. Um, sadly, uh, uh, there are folks who, uh, and, and, and I think they sincerely believe they are helping our, our society by making these, uh, 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 these rulings that aren't truly based on the law, but based more on their opinions. And, and they're just sincerely wrong. Uh, uh, that's not the way our government works. We have three distinct branches of government. Every branch of government has a function. And when the judiciary starts legislating then we have violated separation of powers, we violated the constitution, and we have really thrown out of balance the government that's designed for uh, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Uh, with consent of the governed, do you, do you yes. think we've gotten very far afield from the, the idea of consent of the governed? Uh, certainly you can make that argument. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, it, it's my goal uh, daily as a justice, and you look at my opinions from the last 16 years, it's certainly my goal to enforce the laws as intended because that is with the consent of the governed. And when I were I to vary from that, then it certainly uh, calls into question, where am I finding that power? Uh, Justice Newby, we've only got about two minutes left. I, I want to ask for a, a homework assignment. I'm, I'm asking you to give myself and our viewers a homework assignment. If we love God and country and, and we want to be involved, uh, what can we do? Uh, what would you like to see us do as citizens? Well, first off, uh, First Timothy 2, pray. Uh, and, and I would specifically ask for your and the audience's prayers for me. Uh, I feel awful lot like uh, Solomon. I mean, North Carolina has 10.5 million people, uh, uh, 6,500 members of the judicial branch of which I will be the head, uh, uh, multiple employees. Man, I'm not smart enough to figure this stuff out. I need God's wisdom. And so I asked, uh, uh, just as Solomon went directly to God, my wife and I, I did it this morning, we will do it every morning, asking that God gives me the wisdom uh, that I need, because I can't do it, uh, but he can. He's all powerful, he's all knowing, he's all wise. And I would ask for those prayers. First Timothy two, pray for the religious liberties of our nation. Uh, I certainly have grave concern for uh, uh, folks not appreciating the bedrock principle of religious liberty with regard to all of our liberties, 
it is foundational. That's why it's the first thing in the uh, first of our Bill of Rights. Um, so uh, I would ask for prayers. Uh, what, what would you say to people, uh, young people especially, that, that may want to get involved in, in law or even someday run for office? Um, spend a lot of time in Proverbs. Uh, do a Bible study on uh, God's justice. Um, uh, uh, you know, Proverbs 2, uh, uh, I think it's Proverbs 2, 9 says, then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. When you see the word then, there's a whole bunch of ifs that go before that. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you what they are. I'm not going to tell your audience. Let them go read Proverbs 2. See all the ifs that you need to do. Or read Psalm 1. Uh, meditate on what it means to be a godly man as set out in Psalm 1. And then look at Exodus 17, 18, where Moses' father-in-law gave three qualifications for public service. He said that you need to be uh, capable, you need to be a person of integrity, and you need to fear God. And I would actually put that first. Well, Justice Newby, I thank you so much for your time today. I thank you for your service to our state and our country. And I hope we can visit and converse again very soon. I'm honored to be with you. Thanks again for all that you do. Thank you, my friend. Folks, stay tuned. Truth for a New Generation is back with more after this. We live in an ever-changing culture that continues to fall away from its moral foundations. The AFA Journal provides a Christian perspective on current issues that are important to your family. Produced by the American Family Association, this monthly magazine is full of articles and stories about people who are making a difference in their community and around the world. Sign up today and receive a free six-month subscription. Visit afajournal.org or call 1-800-326-4543. Welcome back to Truth For a New Generation. Wow, what, a, what an exciting honor to have had that conversation with North Carolina Supreme Court Chief Justice Paul Newby. But let's, let's wind it down and talk about what we can do and what our founders intended our government to be. You know, in 1801, Thomas Jefferson, as he was being inaugurated president, he said the following, that, quote, a wise and frugal government, which shall leave free men to regulate their own pursuits of industry and involvement, improvement, shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government, a government that confiscates the money that you earn and really controls and redistributes. Uh, that's not at all what the founders intended. And yet, I think about Venezuela that 30 years ago was one of the richest countries in the world, but because of their desire to address inequities of wealth disparities now has become one of the poorest governments in the civilized world. America doesn't want to go there. And most would have to agree that our nation, with all of the entitlements and the, the social and economic engineers, not only are they deviating from what the founders intended, they're devi deviating from the Constitution, but they're causing greater suffering, not improving the human condition, not improving the American condition. I address this in my book, The Assault on America, and what we must do to defend our freedom, our nation, before it's too late. Now, ignoring our civic duties and not being plugged in and involved and not voting. So many people don't vote. It's jeopardizing the country. Now, I want to give you a quote. God told Israel. Uh, this is in Deuteronomy. God told Israel, get you from each of your tribes wise men, men of understanding, full of knowledge, and I will make them heads over you. God told Israel to be very judicious in the people that they put in positions of leadership. We need to really do that. Now, of the, it's estimated something like 170 130 maybe, 150 million Americans that profess to be Christians, less than one half ever vote or have voted in the last few elections. And as I travel and speak, I meet people with various explanations why they don't want to be involved. They say, well, you know, I'm on my way to heaven. I don't care about this nation. But as we've said many times, that part of the duty of Christians is to be civically informed and civically involved. It really is, even though we know that we're on our way to heaven, it is part of our call and our obligation 
to be involved, to be salt and light. 1984, then President Ronald Reagan said, politics and morality are inseparable. Religion and politics are necessarily related. Our government needs the church, said Reagan. Uh, our government does need the church, and Christians need to be involved. I quote him so often, St. Augustine said, until we're in the city of God, we have an obligation to the city of man. Now, James Madison, that we've quoted a number of times, in Federalist Essay Number 10, 1787, he said that without involvement of principled people, that our government that should be limited and focused, our government would become broad, expansive, intrusive, and controlling. That's where we are. May God grant that his spirit empowers people to stay informed, be involved, and make a difference for what is good and true. That's what's best for the future of America. What is truth? What is truth? Shabam, there it is, the big kahuna, the spicy enchilada, the fizzy lifting drink. The claim God exists is not a subjective claim. This is not an evidence problem. So, like, truth is basically subjective. Yeah. yeah. Emotional. This is Debunk TV. Hi, thanks for watching this special edition of Truth For New Generation Television. Let me encourage you to please buy and read my new book, The Assault on America, How to Defend Our Nation Before It's Too Late. It's online, Amazon, it's in Barnes & Noble. I want to thank all of you for reading this and making this number one in three different categories on Amazon. But we talk about the history of the country, how to understand really what our constitution and government is all about. I believe this book will inform you, inspire you, and equip you to make a difference. And I would urge you to read assault on America. And let me say how much I appreciate the prayers and financial support of the people who are investing in this ministry. You know, for your tax-deductible gift of at least $50, I will send you the award-winning curriculum, the 21 toughest questions your kids will ask about God. It's got seven hours of DVD content and books, and you can use it personally or in small groups. This 21 toughest questions your kids will ask about God, the Bible, Christianity. This is yours for a tax-deductible gift to Alex McFarland Ministries of at least $50. And you'll begin to get our monthly newsletter. There's always some articles, some inspiring things. So let us hear from you today. You can give securely online at alexmcfarland.com, or you can write to us, and the address is on the screen. Now, if you would make the gift at least $75, I want to include the very cool Apologetics t-shirt, Better Living Through Apologetics. I want you to see that design. We're kind of proud of it. Kind of retro, kind of quirky. It's got the Truth for a New Generation logo on the back. And many people have been supporting this year. We're growing. And many lives are being touched. In future shows, I'm going to tell you about that. But pray, stay with us, share, tell your friends, and invest as God leads. Thank you. Thank you.